Thank you for having me tonight. Let me begin with a somewhat subtle point which gets easily lost in this discussion. I would like to make a fine distinction between petroleum and fuel. Uh, they are very close to each other because we always think we just take the petroleum and convert it into fuel, but they are different. What you put into the gas tank could be from a different source. It could be very much cleaner, and it could be made, in principle at least, without petroleum. The problem we have right now is that in some ways the, there is a bottleneck in the system. There is a single link in the chain which has to hold things up, and that is the petroleum. So as a result, you have issues with supply bottlenecks. You have issues with getting larger and larger units, which are prone to bigger and bigger failures. So it's, I think, time to think about alternatives. And today, my goal here is to talk about technological issues and technological alternatives to move forward. And basically, you have two. One is, you have heard a minute ago, that the, the transportation fuels are basically 100% petroleum. One is to abandon transportation fuels. The other option is to instead use the, the, the uh, fuel which is made without petroleum, without oil. And I think this idea is not entirely new. You have seen this in the past, and this is basically the story of the hydrogen economy. If you start out with water which you take out of the environment, which in a way is the ash of the fuel which you burned, and you have some power generator, a windmill or a solar panel, I can make you hydrogen and oxygen. The oxygen you can release to the air, the hydrogen you give to the vehicle, that vehicle then may run an electric motor, it may run a combustion engine, but whatever it does, it combines hydrogen and oxygen to make the water and it takes the, the energy out. Now, my argument is, if only I can figure out how to collect not just water, but also CO2, which is plentiful in the air, by the way, I can take those two things together and make a synthetic fuel. That could be gasoline, this could be synthetic diesel, this could be dimethyl ether, which has the advantage that it burns more cleanly. So you end up with a designer fuel you can use the way you want. And I would argue that kind of technology path is actually feasible. Uh, you may think of biofuels doing effectively just that. The trees or the algae or whatever you grow, the corn crop ends up collecting CO2 and water from the environment and with the help of sunshine converts it into, into uh, fuel and which is then later used in the vehicle or whatever other application you had in mind. So I started to ask what are actually the conditions to do that beyond biology, and maybe we can find other options which are equally good, if not better. And I think you need, in, a, in the end, a handful of technologies which I argue all of them at some level exist. You clearly will need water, and if you don't have water readily available, you may have to desalinate seed water, so that's a, an enabling technology. You clearly would like to have some energy source. Here I'm suggesting photovoltaic energy as the source of your energy, and you will need the carbon, which you get in the form of CO2. And now that I have it, I can run an electrolyzer, a machine which breaks up water into hydrogen and oxygen. By the way, you can do this with very high efficiency, 70%. And then I can run this into a fischer tropsch plant, which have been around as a li literally since the 1920s, and Sasol has demonstrated that you can make synthetic fuels from coal via that route but you mix carbon monoxide and hydrogen, or for that matter, carbon dioxide and hydrogen, and you can produce essentially any fuel you like, and then you combust it, and you close the loop by going back through the, through the ocean, you get your water back, and through the atmosphere, you get your CO2 back. And mind you, you will have to get the CO2 back, because if you don't get the CO2 back, I cannot close the loop. All that carbon will pile up in the atmosphere, and we are stuck. That's the climate change issue we have right now. I would argue all of these technologies exist. I should probably say a few words about the air capture because it's somewhat novel. Uh, we have been involved in this story. We have developed an anionic exchange resin, a material absorbent, which has the remarkable feature that when it's dry, it absorbs CO2 out of the air. You can think of this like a pine branch or a bottle brush, as we called it. And you can let, let it sit in the, in, the, in, the, in the air as the wind blows through. In an hour, it loads itself up with CO2. And then if you make it wet, it releases that CO2 again. So we call that a moisture-driven CO2 swing or humidity swing. As a result, we can collect CO2, we can free it again, we can close the loop just like we want. By the way, this is not entirely new. People have done this on submarines and space stations for a very long time. We just 
try to make it bigger and ultimately cheaper. So if you can do that, you can capture CO from the, from the air. As a matter of fact, you can capture it much faster than trees would do because you are not limited by the sunshine. And those air extractors can collect anywhere. So a big picture would be these huge uh, goalpost-like objects which stand there and collect CO2 at, at a very rapid rate. As a matter of fact, a unit that size would be about 300 tons. The container shipping, ship, shipping container size unit could do it in a ton a day. And this, this little brush you see we actually built is worth a few grams, grams in, a, uh, in, a, in, a few hour, in a day or so. So it can be done. And we can then move and ask, how could we make such an industry actually work? What's missing? And you have heard about Moore law law before, Moore's, Moore's law before. And you see here, if you look at those two power plants, guess which one of the two is the cheaper one? By the way, you can take the leather seats as well. Uh, they, they are in the price. Uh, a car engine is give or take $20 per kilowatt of power it can deliver. A power plant is somewhere around 1500 So you start asking, why that enormous discrepancy? And in my view, these are the marvels of mass production. We usually think the bigger we make things, the cheaper they get. That's the economies of scale. But you can put next to these economies of scales the economies of mass production, the learning which goes with mass production, which ends up making things cheaper. And I think in this particular case, you can see that you have won. There's another example where it won spectacularly. On the left, you see the old craze the supercomputers, the big guys who, who could do thousands, could handle hundreds and hundreds of users. And nowadays, even if you have a supercomputer or a server farm, it's made out of the little guys in an aggregate. So we are arguing that in a, in a way, if you want to get fossil fuel, if you want to get away from fossil fuels, if you want to get away from petroleum, you can go and use photovoltaic panels, which are individually small. They become mass produced and the price comes down. And I think you really have to put on your banner a low price. Somewhere between one and two cents a kilowatt hour, you can actually win against oil uh, because you would be cheaper in the entire chain. And the bottleneck is actually driving the price of solar down. If you get there, you can do this. My view is that mass production, at the end of the day, gives you the best chance. So in a way, I would argue, we have all the ingredients to make all of those work. We have to figure out how to get there with existing technology. The novelty in the approach I'm pro proposing here is not photovoltaics. We have had silicon cells for the last 50 years. It's not even air capture. We have done it in, in submarines for the last 60, 70 years. Uh, it is really the, the mass production paradigm and that it can ultimately lower costs dramatically. And I think in order to make it work, you need a high degree of automation. Because think about it for a second, if I have one ton a day unit of collecting CO2 and I want to set a price in the end around $30 a ton, I cannot have a four, three people running that machine. It has to be automated to a degree we haven't seen in the past. And in my personal opinion, this is why we haven't gone that route in the past. Because if you had a power plant made out of car size units, you would in the past have 10,000 people operating. But today, I can automate this. Witness the fact that there are now cars which have driven through the desert by themselves in a DARPA challenge. So we can get to the level of automation to make these things happen. So then you are starting to talk about granular small units which compete with each other, which completely changes the game. So you have a vendor model versus a utility model. You don't have big utility companies running huge machines which are all one of a kind. You have small ones which may not last as long, are constantly being replaced, but that starts competition and drives prices down over time. So in the end of the day, I would argue energy may be cheaper than it is today, because if you go that route, it's not clear to me that we couldn't drive prices down a lot lower than they are today. So we are not really limited to where we were. In the end, I'm really asking for you to turn that pyramid you have in your mind in the energy sector upside down. Right now, we think we start with raw chemicals, we refine them, and ultimately, at the top of the pyramid, the best kind of for form of energy we have is electricity. I think in a world which is dominated by wind and sunshine, you have primary electricity, the stuff which comes right when the sun shines or right when the wind blows. And that's what you are after. And now you collect it. And you can either make it into user electricity, you may use at right the moment you want electricity, or you convert it into fuels, which you use whenever you want 
on board of a vehicle. And keep in mind, gasoline stores about 100 times as much energy as a battery. So it may very well be that that car in the future is an electric car, but it most likely has a fuel cell and liquid hydrocarbons in the back of the tank, because that way you can get a long distance. And I think I'll close and let you think about those kind of issues. And thank you so much for your attention.